respected brothers and elders and sisters, alhamdulillah, today we have now heard the completion of the Quran. And this is a very deep bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we get the opportunity to listen to the words being recited. There are many places in this world where that opportunity is not available. Just to give you an idea of uh, how fortunate we are in this country and in the circumstances, circumstances that you and I face. I have said this speech, or I have shared this uh, story in other talks before, and I'm going to share it again because it's something that very is very close to me. It really resonates with me. The type of ease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in comparison to the sacrifices people had to give before us. And when it comes to the circumstances that we are in, the circumstances of ease, the circumstances of freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, having the ability to erect masjids, erect masallahs in Islamic centers. This is a tremendous bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are living in a state where shukr is demanded of us. There are other people who are living in a state where sabr is demanded from them. Whether it's going to be our brothers and sisters in China, in Syria, in Yemen, and the list goes on. I just wanted to share one story that how sacrifices have been made by those people who were who were not given this type of ease. When it comes to our Islamic history, a very big portion of our development happened in Russia, in current day Russia. This is the place where we have the famous and Bukhara, uh, places that were rich of knowledge, places where the likes of Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi came from, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi came from. And this was a place that had gone through a transition where Islamic knowledge was once flourishing, there was huge centers that were built, beautiful, in, beautiful infrastructure, beautiful architecture was put in place. However, all of that slowly became empty. The buildings were there, but the people to occupy it was not there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then had put upon the people a type of system where now they were not allowed to practice any religion anymore. The system of communism, which was around for a while. In that system, there were those Muslims who felt that we cannot give up our faith in any circumstance. We cannot let go of our Iman in any condition. So whatever it takes to protect our Iman, we will do. Keep this in mind. Whatever it takes to protect our Iman, we will do. So, one of my very close friends who used to be a classmate of mine, we were both in the same hips class back in 1990. And I got to see him only a few months ago after, what, 20-something years. Uh, he was telling me that he had gone to those places, this for some programs, and he was now being acquainted with the history of that place and the sacrifices the Muslim community and the ulama had to give. And he posed a question that if I were to tell you that a person who is teaching Sahih al-Bukhari drinks and smokes, what are you going to say? The first thing we're going to say is Tawbah Astaghfar. Okay? Well, what type of hypocrite is this? On one hand, this person is saying that Rasulullah said this, on the other hand, this person is drinking. What type of a scholar is this? But everything requires context. I always remember this. Whenever we hear something in isolation, it's only to a million and one interpretations. But when we hear it in its proper context, then everything makes complete sense. So here you have the scholars of those days. In that time, while that regime and while that system was implemented in the place where Islam once flourished, the Islam that you and I have inherited, especially in South Asia, we've inherited a lot of the Russian uh, contributions of Islam. So, in that place, in order for a person to not be detected as a Muslim, they were required to keep bottles of liquor, wine, beer, whatever, whatever was available, to look normal, 
in society. So you would have police that would come into the homes, they would make sure that there's no, there's no uh, indication and there's no sign of Islam. And one of the ways to assert that or to affirm that was to make sure that there are bottles of liquor that are lined up for the police to see. Okay, so every Muslim was now carrying liquor. And what would happen in order for the small children to learn Islam, they had to create secret classrooms that were hidden behind walls, hidden behind doors. They had to go underground very quietly, making sure that they're not going to be detected. And they were not going into well-built cells. Okay, whatever was available for them through which they can transmit the knowledge of the Qur'an, the knowledge of hadith, they would do. A shaykh al-hadith that would be teaching Sahih al-Bukhari, he would be on his way to his class. His class would be in a horse stable, in the outdoors, during the frigid seasons. Okay, not in a nice heated classroom, a nice heated room. That would not be available to them. So in the horse stables, hiding behind the horses, that's where they would be teaching Sahih al-Bukhari. And how would they go? The Ustad, what he would have to do is he would have, he would have to um, hide his copies of Sahih al-Bukhari in the pocket of the horse saddle. They would be traveling on horse. So the sides, they have pockets. They would put the copy of Bukhari at the bottom of the pocket. On top of that, they would put a plank of wood. On top of the wood, they would put bottles of liquor. Now as they would be uh, traveling and they would be going, there's obviously there, there's police that's going to stop them. Hey, where are you going? Okay, because they want to understand what's going on here. Everything is being monitored. So he would keep his cool, jump off his horse, open up the pocket, flip out a bottle of liquor, hand it over to the police, get one of his own, pop it up, they'd start drinking. Okay? We think astaghfirullah al but here we're doing this because a person is in exceptional circumstances. It's not like the guy is enjoying, oh, come on, let's drink up. Okay? It's not like they're really enjoying this. This is an exceptional circumstance. It's the only way they can protect their iman because the moment they are detected, they are adios amigos. You're gone. Sadaqallah al -Azim. Okay? There's no, no person that's going to protect you. No such thing as civil rights and human rights. Nothing like that. You're gone. Finished. Okay? And how is Islam protected? How is knowledge protected? It is protected by the heirs of knowledge. The carriers of knowledge. Take them away and knowledge is just an abstract thing. It's just something. It's just a label. So now what would happen? They would drink and once the police officer felt that this guy is normal, he would let him go and he would trot off on, into the stable, classes waiting for them, or for the Ustad. They would start their doodles of the body and what would happen is there is no heat. Obviously they're out in the, they're in the outdoors and Russian winters are not the best of winters. So the only source of heat that they had back in those days was the excrement of the horses. They would have to wait till the horse relieves itself. They would then put their feet in the excrement to get some heat. That's the type of sacrifice they would make back in those days. And you and I are in extreme comfort at this moment. If we are not going to say Alhamdulillah, we are doing a tremendous disservice to ourselves. So for us to right now be in these numbers, listening to the Qur'an being recited, this is a tremendous bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please, for the sake of Allah, do not take this for granted. Now, once we have had the opportunity to listen, this is going to be the beginning of our connection to the Qur'an. It's not the end of the connection. It's the beginning. The first thing that the Prophet sallallahu is being told is, He's being told to spread and propagate whatever has been revealed to him from his Lord. And what would be the first way and the first methodology in order to accomplish that? Okay. The first is the tilawah, it's the recitation. 
The Prophet sallallahu is being told to recite whatever he has, whatever portion of the book has been revealed to him. That's the bismillah. So our beautiful Imam here, mashallah, has executed that in the very fashion that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is doing. Doing the tidaw. That's the introduction. That's what we're hearing the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it doesn't stop there. After that, what, we suppo- what are we supposed to do? The Prophet sallallahu is being told, not only is he going to recite it, after the introduction of Allah's word to the community, there's going to be a reformation process, a purification process, purification of our beliefs and notions, purification of our character, purification of our heart. And that is going to be accomplished by teaching the the very uh, word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the community. Where the Prophet ﷺ is going to not just recite but actively teach the community the application of the Qur'an. How to bring this into your life, how you live it, how you approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it. So what we need to understand is that the Qur'an's purpose is not confined to recitation. The Qur'an's purpose is for us to live it. And that's what we hear in the beginning verses of uh, Surah Al-Baqarah. We just heard it right now in the last Safat. Hudallil Muttaqeen. That it is a guide for the Allah conscious. That if a person wants to approach Allah, Allah's way, the Quran is the book that's going to tell you how to do that. But it's not just for the Muttaqeen. As we hear in the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah further on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He also talks about some of the Qualities of this Quran. Udalil nas wa bayinatim min al huda wa al-Qur'an. Wa al-Qur'an. So it's not only for the believers, but it is also for all of humanity. Udalil nas. What happens is the Quran is there to guide humanity to Allah. Keep this in mind. The Quran's purpose is to guide humanity to Allah. And you want to see an example of that? Look at Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anh when he reads the opening verses of Surah Maha at his sister's home while he's on to assassinate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's coming across the verses, إِنَّ لِي أَنَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِنَّ أَنَا فَعْبُدْنِي وَأَقْنِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي All of these verses had affected it so much that those verses led him to recognizing who Allah is. So that's Hudad al-Nas. This is our job as Muslims. Our job as Muslims in this society is to share that word with all of Canadian society to show them this is the Allah that created you. This is the Allah that's sustaining you. This is the Allah that you have to return to. If you want to know Him, this is the book to read. And then there's going to be clear evidences and proofs of guidance. And it is also a Quran for those people who have come before this nation and they came up with varying notions on what Tawheed, what monotheism is all about. This book basically settles the score. You're going to have people that were holding councils for a month long debating is Jesus the Son of God, is He equal to God, is He just one level down to God? Or we're going to have people that are going to now pick and choose as to what edicts of Allah they want to follow. And then you're going to have individuals that are going to develop brand new regulations such as the Quran attributed to Allah. Now you have a state of extreme confusion. What is authentic? What is really from Allah? This is what the Quran is here to clarify. What Quran? It is the criteria. It is the book that's going to make it clear what is right and what is wrong even today. When we have such confusion because we are living in a time where different notions have developed, different practices have made it under the banner of Islam. If we want to know is this truly from Allah or not, the movement's resort is the Quran, the Quran. The Barakallahi Nazar al Quran, as Allah says. Blessed be that being who has sent down the criteria. So it is there to clarify. But the Bayyana Rushu bin al righteousness has been made distinct from wrong. So these are some of the key qualities of the Quran. That not only are we going to be reciting it or listening to its recitation, but we're going to be accessing it. We're going to lead ourselves to Allah. Once we have now recognized this is Allah, then comes the Hudalli Muttaqin. Okay, the first step is knowing Allah, subscribing to La ilaha illallah, 
elevate our Islam to the next level, inshallah. Let's deepen our connection to the Quran starting from this Ramadan. Find the paths through which we can enhance our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because at the end of the day, why are we learning the Quran? It's to get our connection with Allah right. It's all about Allah. Our life revolves around Allah. We are Allah-focused communities. Okay? We are Allah-focused people. And if everything began from Allah, it will end at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, we want to live for Allah. So let's make that commitment today. Let's put in our heart these very words. Let's actually make that declaration publicly right now. Let's say it. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati